Guys, I've never been so excited to talk about men's clothing because today we are talking about the high priest's garments and how they point us toward Christ. Hello friends, my name is Matt. Welcome so much to my channel, Learn to Discern. If you could please take a second to subscribe, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, so a couple of things I want to put out there up front. Number one, Pastor Mike Winger has done a very extensive video, about 45 or 50 minutes, on this exact topic. I will place a link in the description. You can check that out if you want to get into even greater detail. And number two, because this is a part of our series, Jesus in the Old Testament, I'm not really going to go in-depth on the New Testament teaching of Jesus as our high priest. I encourage you to read the book of Hebrews, particularly chapter 4 and chapter 7, if you want more on that. But we come in, hopefully, with that understanding that Jesus is our ultimate high priest. So with that, let's look and see the typology and the symbolism that is there in the garments of the high priest in the Old Testament. Because I understand they're not the most exciting passages of Scripture, but when you have this understanding, it can really blow your mind. And that's what I hope to do today. So let's start with uh, the, the base level, if you will, of the high priest garments. And they would really have, the high priest would have uh, an under layer of pure white linen. So pure white linen undergarments that would really go from his neck all the way down to his feet, covering him completely in white. Now, we know from Scripture that white symbolizes purity, right? Moral perfection. And so this is symbolizing perfect morality, perfect righteousness. Now, we know from Scripture that the high priest himself this man who was standing in was not morally perfect. That's why he had to offer sins for himself. But he was picturing and foreshadowing a high priest who would come who would be perfectly righteous. So a base layer of pure white symbolizing the righteousness and the purity of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Now, above that uh, the undergarments, you had a robe. And we're going to read about this robe. This is Exodus 28, starting in verse 31. It says, Make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth, with an opening for the head in its center. There shall be a woven edge like a collar around this opening, so that it will not tear. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. The gold bells and the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe. So above this layer of pure white, now we're getting something that's a little bit more decorative, a little bit more, more beautiful, you could say, because we have a garment, a robe, that is filled with colors of blue and purple and scarlet, which, by the way, are the colors of royalty, right? Especially purple, the color of royalty. So this is pointing us to a high priest who's going to be a king. Uh, we did a video looking before about Christ being a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who was both priest and king. So kingly sort of colors, gold. This is supposed to be beautiful. This is supposed to be glorious. This is supposed to be ornate. This is uh, something that was very costly, very expensive. But not only do we have these beautiful colors and designs, also along the edge of the robe, you had the alternating pomegranates and bells made of gold. And so this also something that's very expensive, very beautiful, and is meant to draw attention to the high priest. There is something unique. There, it's beauty, it's glory, it's honor. Of course, Jesus Christ, the beautiful one, the glorious one. Okay, then we get above the robe, we have the ephod. The ephod was made of the same color, so blue and purple and scarlet yarn and interwoven with gold thread. So the same themes there that we saw before, but it also had two onyx stones on the shoulder. And we're going to read about that here in Exodus 28 verses 9 through 12. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in the order of their birth, six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones, the way a gem cutter engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in gold filigree settings and fasten them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron is to bear the names of his, on his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. 
So we see that the first high priest for Israel was Aaron, and these two onyx stones have on them written all of the tribes of Israel, so all of the people of Israel, God's chosen people. And it says he is to wear these stones with the names on his shoulder, and he is to bear the name, the names of the people. And so we know that this high priest is representing his people before God. You see, the same way that Jesus, our high priest, bears our name and represents us before God. And so symbolic, even at that time, showing that the high priest was to represent all of God's people before God himself. Okay, above um, the the uh, ephod, we had the breast piece. Now, the breast piece, once again, the same colors as the ephod, so more beauty, more splendor, more glory and majesty. Um, and this breast piece also had on it 12 stones. So you had the two onyx stones on the shoulder. Now you have a breast piece, obviously on your breast, that has 12 stones. And each of these 12 stones has written on it one of the tribes of Israel. So this is Exodus 28, and now we're in verse 29. It says, Whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breast piece of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. So once again, we have the idea that this person, the high priest, is going to represent the people before God. Okay, moving up the body, if we will, we get to the turban. If you remember, I said before you had the pure white undergarments, and I said from the neck down. Well, now you have a turban on the head that is also pure white. So from head to toe, this high priest is perfectly moral, perfectly righteous. But there's another part to the turban as well. There is a gold plate on the outside of this turban that has a very specific phrase inscribed on it. In fact, let's read Exodus 28, 36 through 38. Make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it as, a, as on a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten a blue cord to it to attach it to the turban. It is to be on the front of the turban. It will be on Aaron's forehead, and he will bear the guilt involved in the sacred gifts the Israelites consecrate, whatever their gifts may be. It will be on Aaron's forehead continually, so that they will be acceptable to the Lord. So now we have this gold uh, plate on the outside of the turban that says, Holy to the Lord. Well, what's so interesting is that, is Aaron himself completely holy unto the Lord? No. No. And so God is intervening and making Aaron, making this man holy to the Lord, but it is pointing us ahead toward Christ, the one who is indeed perfectly and infinitely holy. In fact, scripture would say he is holy, 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 holy to the infinite degree. There's something that's even more beautiful about this that I want to point out. If you noticed that as the instructions were being given, it said specifically that the gold plate was to bear the guilt for uh, the holy things. Um, in the version that I read, it says it will bear uh, the guilt for the sacred gifts. And so the idea is that even as the Israelites were bringing their gifts, their offerings, their sacrifices, the offerings and the sacrifices were not completely holy to the Lord. They were not completely perfect either. And they needed to be atoned for. And we see that also in the book of Hebrews. It's talking about how those sacrifices were not pure enough to deal with sin, right? So these sacrifices, these gifts, they needed to be cleansed as well. And so now we have the plate that is bearing the guilt for the holy things, if you will. Now, this is really fascinating. I hope that this will blow your mind. It is so, so amazing. So you remember at the very beginning of the Bible, the fall, Adam and Eve, they fall into sin and the curse comes not only against men and women, but uh, uh, against the world. The whole world is cursed. And in fact, one of the things that is mentioned in Genesis 3 as a part of the curse is that the ground would be cursed. And specifically, it is mentioned that one of the signs of the curse on the ground would be thorns and thistles, right? So thorns were symbolic of the fact that not just mankind was cursed, but that all of creation was cursed. And so we are told that on the forehead will be the thing that will bear the penalty for the things that are cursed, symbolized by the crown, guys, or, or, or by the thorns. I got ahead of myself. 
Jesus on the cross wears a crown of thorns on his head. He takes the thorns, symbolic of the fall of creation, upon his head. Jesus is not only paying the price for mankind, he is paying the price to redeem and restore all of creation. This is beautiful typology, beautiful symbolism that should make us see that you know, Jesus was not plan B and uh, God was just winging it. No, this was the plan from the very beginning. Even when he's giving the garments to the high priest, he knows exactly who Jesus is and what he is going to accomplish. Okay, so that is the outfit. I also want to point out a couple of other things, and these are also amazing. I mentioned the colors that you have with this outfit. So you have the blue, the purple, the scarlet, and the gold. These colors are very important because not only do they... Uh, denote beauty and majesty and glory. They are the same colors that are used on the inside of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the place where God comes to meet with his people. It is the dwelling place, if you will, of God. And so now you have this high priest, this man, who when you look at him, he would remind you of the dwelling place of God. In fact, he would remind you of God's presence itself. Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the very presence of God as he comes to minister as our great high priest. Last thing, guys, so amazing, this last one too. So the high priest's garments, as I said, would have been very expensive, very ornate, would have uh, really demonstrated a ton of beauty. He would have really stood out as he went around. And it was meant to be that way. He was meant to stand out, to be so beautiful. And he would have to wear these day in and day out as he performed his duties. There was one exception to that, and that was on the Day of Atonement. So the one day that the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies to make the sacrifice on behalf of the people to take away their sin. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take off all of the outer layers of the garments, everything that was colorful, ornate, beautiful, and he would walk in in just the pure white undergarments to make the sacrifice for the people. He would come back out, and then he would put back on the rest of his attire. Guys, think about it. Jesus Christ, who is eternally God in all of his beauty and glory, and splendor. He never ceases being God, but he lays aside some of the glory and the divine privileges to come and live as a man and, and, and fulfills all perfect righteousness. The pure white makes a sacrifice to make atonement for us, and then he ascends into heaven and is restored with all of his glory and all of his majesty. Guys, what a beautiful picture of who Jesus is and what he uh, ultimately accomplished for us. So I understand, again, that sometimes we read these passages in the Old Testament and you think, these details are really boring. What's the point? I hope you see now there is a point, and it's really awesome. Guys, our God is so amazing. He is so great. Uh, I'm really excited to help bring some of this information to you. I hope it's a blessing. We're going to continue on with many videos just like that in our series, Jesus in the Old Testament. As I said, if you could please take a second to subscribe to make sure you can follow along and get some good Bible teaching that will help you grow in your affection for Christ. Until next time, God bless.